So tonight, as we, uh, as we meditate on those lyrics, we're also going to go through the Christmas story together. Thank you. I need to make sure my head doesn't get cut off in the video. Um, so we're going to be going through Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2 tonight, if you brought your Bibles. And we're going to be going through the Christmas story together. This sounds so good. Thank you, Pastor Larry. Um, I don't know if y'all, uh, everyone has different Christmas traditions every single year. How many of y'all would read the Christmas story each year uh, for Christmas? Yeah, absolutely. So this has been a great tradition for my family who's here tonight. Um, we would do candlelight services and just kind of meditate on what truly is the message of Christmas. Because nowadays, um, you just watch TV and everything, and what, what does the world tell us the message of Christmas is? It's buying and exchanging gifts, um, something about an elf that disappears and then reappears in the house, and um, all sorts of just different, different things that are not bad, but there's something that brought all of us out here tonight on Christmas Eve where we could have been with our families, we could have stayed warm at home, but there was something more important beyond that that said we needed to be here tonight. And so we're gonna go through what that message truly is. So, leading up to the Christmas story in the Gospels of Luke, um, the last time we had heard anything in scripture was from the uh, prophet Malachi. I always want to call him Malachi, the great Italian prophet, but it was Malachi. And he, he spoke and he hinted about uh, someone with the uh, spirit of Elijah coming and setting the roads ahead of the Savior in the last chapter. But then we got 400 years of silence where nothing was said at all. There's tension in Israel. It grew as God's people went from Babylonian captivity. And as soon as they got back into Israel, they went into Greek captivity in the hands of the Greeks and then straight into the hands of the Roman Empire and Herod. And so they're looking for a savior. They believe that God has grown silent and they're looking for a savior. And unto them, into the world in this Christmas story, a child was born. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. So in uh, Luke chapter 1, a little bit before we start to hear of Mary, um, an angel appears uh, to Elizabeth and Zechariah and talks to them about having a baby in their late stage in life. And uh, that baby is John the Baptist, who is the prophet that Malachi was speaking about that would go before Jesus and lay the roads ahead of Jesus in his ministry. And then um, G uh, John the Baptist is Jesus's cousin. And then the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. And this is what it says. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnant, uh, pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and ever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age. 
and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her six months uh, stage of pregnancy. So for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So in this stage in the message, we meditate on the courage that Mary had, that she would receive a word that in all unlikeliness, uh, earthly, that she would have a son and not be with a man, and that she would look on her, uh, her family, Elizabeth, and that she's having a baby this late in the stage. This is only something the Lord could do. And so the Christmas story is about the miraculous and that the Son of God was coming through someone like Mary is beautiful. And then the next thing, we'll go into Luke chapter 2. Forgot to write the verse down, but it'll be, uh, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus is where we'll start. So Luke chapter 2. So, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Canaris was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth, to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, uh, firstborn a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning that he had been, uh, that they had been told uh, them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which we were just as they had been told. And then on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise, circumcise the child, he was uh, named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived to Mary. Isn't this just such a beautiful moment? I'd love to just kind of place myself in the, uh, the shepherd's shoes during that experience of what was going on. That within, in the light of being a people that's been under persecution for so long and then hearing for years and years a savior is coming and then the angels appearing before you and then seeing that savior born before you. I was talking with my dad earlier today, and it's even more interesting because these weren't just any shepherds. My dad, who's right over there, he reminded me that these shepherds were the ones that actually prepared uh, the livestock for the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, 
uh, for the sacrificial services. So not only was Jesus born, but he was born in a place where they prepared the sacrifices to atone for sins and ritual cleansing. So it was purposeful that Jesus was born right as he was. So as we put our uh, ourselves in the shoes of the shepherds, I'd love to just kind of read something over y'all. Imagine you are a shepherd living in the fields outside of Bethlehem, tending to your flock on the night Jesus was born. It's a cold and clear evening, and the stars are shining brightly in the sky. Suddenly an angel appears before you, announcing the good news of the Messiah's birth. You are filled with awe and excitement as you realize that this is the moment you've been waiting for your entire life. You gather your sheep and make your way to the stable where Jesus is lying in a manger, surrounded by Mary and Joseph. As you stand there gazing at the newborn Savior, you are overwhelmed with joy, gratitude, knowing that this child will one day bring salvation to the world. One of uh, my favorite quotes comes from a pastor named Jensen Franklin, and he says, one of the greatest needs wasn't knowledge or God would have sent an educator. Our greatest need wasn't entertainment or pleasure, our God would have sent an entertainer. Our greatest need was forgiveness because we couldn't get our lives together, so we sent a savior. And that's who they discovered that night in Bethlehem in the cold. So as we process the Christmas story, let's break it down together. The Christmas story is the story of Jesus. The Christmas story is a story of hope, of joy and redemption. Through the birth of Jesus, God has given us the greatest gift of all, which is salvation, reconciliation back to the Father to be in relationship with him. So point one, the birth of Jesus fulfills prophecy. The birth of Jesus was no ordinary event. It was the fulfillment of centuries of God's promises to send a savior to his people. Through the Old Testament, God had revealed through prophets what a savior would be born of a virgin and that he would be the Messiah, the anointed one who would bring salvation to the world. When Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, he told her that she would bear a son that would be the son of God. And he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, God taking on flesh around us. He is here, he is with us, and he is with us even today. And we see this in Luke 1.35. So the birth of Jesus was the fulfillment of God's promise to send a Savior, and it marked the beginning of the greatest story of redemption in human history. So one of the prophecies, for example, would be Isaiah 9.6. For uh, unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Second point. So the first point was the birth of Jesus fulfills prophecy, but our second point is the birth of Jesus brings joy and peace. The birth of Jesus was a time of great joy. When the angels appeared to the shepherds and announced the good news of Jesus' birth, they said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people, which is Luke 2.10. The shepherds were overjoyed at the news, and they rushed to Bethlehem to see Jesus for themselves. When they arrived, they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, and they told everyone they met about the miraculous birth. The joy and celebration that accompanied Jesus' birth was a foretaste of the peace and joy that would be brought to the world through his death and resurrection. Um, before this uh, sermon, um, I had asked Laramie if he could play Oh Holy Night. And uh, one of my favorite parts of that song is uh, it's just one quick line and it says, a weary world rejoices. And it wasn't just for Jesus's time for his earthly ministry, but it's for Jesus's time here in the stage, the age that we're in of the church that no matter what we're going through of medical issues, anxiety, all the issues that come with a fallen world, his peace, his joy is not circumstantial and that we have 
a tether. We have a link to something greater that is beyond circumstantial experiences that we have today. So that is something that we experience through the birth of Christ. So point one, the birth of Jesus fulfills prophecy. Point two, the birth of Jesus brings joy and peace. And then point three, the birth of Jesus brings salvation to the world. The most significant aspect of Jesus' birth was the fact that he came to bring salvation to the world. Through his life, through his death and resurrection, Jesus would reconcile us to God and restore our relationship with him that was broken at the fall of man. The angel Gabriel told Mary that Jesus would save his people from their sins in Matthew 1.21. And Jesus himself said, I have come that they might have life and life abundant. John 10.10, 10. the birth of Jesus marked the beginning of God's plan to redeem the world and bring salvation to all who would believe him. So our first point, the birth of Jesus fulfills prophecy. The birth of Jesus brings joy and peace. And then third, the birth of Jesus brings salvation to the world. So what do we do with this message? How do we apply it in our own lives? How do we take this from here? So as we celebrate Christmas, we can be filled with hope and joy and gratitude, knowing that through the birth of Jesus, God has given us the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of salvation and reconciliation back to a loving father. Let us remember the significance of Jesus' birth and the impact it has had on our lives. Let us share the good news of Jesus with others, and let us strive to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to him. May the joy and peace of Christmas be with you and your families this holiday season.